to explain that I wouldn't be able to take him to his trumpet lesson once today. And he said, why not? And I said, well, I'm going to be talking about the 60s. And he said, you're doing what? Why are you talking about the 60s? Who's interested in that? And I smiled. <laughs> oh, God. If you're 12, I suppose that is rather a peculiar thing to be thinking about. And then I suddenly realised, as I was talking to him, I realised that I was born in the early 40s, and that was 30 years after the start of the First World War. And I grew up thinking the First World War was the previous century. It wasn't anything to do with me. And then I suddenly became aware that the 60s are a mere 50 years ago. And it does feel very located in what I'm saying. I'm a Marxist, an activist. I would never have used that term, I suppose, before the last 10 years. I would always call myself something like a trade union militant, but I think it's, activism is the right term. I'm a product of the 60s, and I'm also a product of the IMG. Uh, they may, those who were in the IMG, not want to see me as the product, but I certainly see myself as from that tradition. And I suddenly read this week that Heine had a view about the party, and his party was the party of flowers and nightingales. And I suddenly thought, I wish my was in a party of, you know, flowers and nightingales, because the IMG certainly wasn't like that. And, and I'm glad that, that there are two people I want to talk about before I start speaking. One is Pete Seeger. I was going to mention him, and I'm glad Fred has done so. Because, of course, growing up in, as a teenager, although I don't think I was called a teenager in the, in the 50s, uh, music was hugely important. And people like Seeger, and then, of course, later Dylan, was massive influence on many of us. And you just knew that these were people who were wanting to puncture, in some way, the established order. And they were singing of youth and aspirations and hopes and alternative visions. And the 1950s was certainly a period needing alternative visions. It was a period of security, full employment, increasing wealth, apparently. Wealth doesn't mean the same in the 1950s as it does in the 2010s. Consumer goods and established establishment. But the other person who I've been reading this week is Ben Said, Daniel Ben Said. And I've been reading An Impatient Life. And it struck me, uh, there are two or three things that made a huge impact on me in the very early part of the book, where he's trying to talk about why, in fact, he's writing something which is autobiographical, attempting to explore what, what had happened in his political framework. And he was concerned about the use of the word we. And I think that this is, I, it just struck me really hard. He said he was concerned about the word we, and he settled in the end on thinking about himself as I, we, or one. And he said, you somehow need the voice of the fourth person singular in which no one speaks, and yet which does exist. And this is from uh, Ferlinghetti, who is an American poet. But he continues that we is unstable and uncertain. It sometimes denotes a definite group, and for Ben Said, of course, it was a league. Sometimes an invisible community whose links and affinities run below the deceptive surface of visible communities, or again, a tacit conspiracy, without formal membership, limits, or borders. And I, thinking back over the last 50 years of my life, I suppose that's what we has been for me. It's been sometimes formal, a lot of the time informal, but in a sense, you become aware of what those comrades are, who the comrades are around you, even in a way that you never sort of, you know, become aware of it until something is said, something is argued, something is done. And then he says, yet eternity does not exist. So it's necessary to wager on the non-inevitable share of becoming inscribed in this general faculty of surpassing, not achieving, but 
surpassing, he doesn't say that, but that's my bit, that takes varying forms in dreams, imagination and desire, each of us aiming to go beyond the limits. Because for all of us, whoever we are, and particularly those of us who've been on the left or are in the left and still consider ourselves part of this, it is knowing that we're not going to necessarily accomplish what we want, but we know there are things that attach to dreams, imagination and desires which all the time make us wake up each day. And this is the bit that I think, for me, just made complete sense. The notion of commitment clumsily evokes this logical waver, wager on the uncertain. It's a secular, daily, everyday wager launched anew each day. And it's the ability to be able to get up and to think there are going to be things that you can do. Now, the 1950s, it was a state where social democracy was in battle with capital. Uh, the Labour Party and trade union power was used as a benevolent control over the aspirations of the working class, while struggling at times for increased welfare rights, services for an enlarged public sector, organising for economic security, free health care, extension of education and decent homes. And it was when capital was booming after the war, with the consumer society being key for capital accumulation. The trade unions were determined to control developing shop stewards movements, which in fact were currents responding to increasing pressure on workers, speed up with one of the issues in lots of the private sector, and with capitalist profitability on the increase, a demand for increasing wages. It was, however, a Britain of Macmillan's wonderful phrase, you've never had it so good. But it was also a period where Britain was hanging on to the empire. India had gone, various other states had gone, but in the 50s it was Kenya and the battle with Mama, which was, I mean, it's only in the last year or two that people have started to really look and think about what in fact the British were doing in relation to, uh, to the uh, Kikuyus. There was Malaya, and then, of course, there was 1956. And I think that was probably the first political event I can remember. My father was around the CP, um, but he came down to London for the demonstration against Suez. And it was so clear then that post-45, America, had, the United States, had quite clearly been the paymaster for Britain. And yet it was not acknowledged politically. Politically, Britain was still feeling that it still had its possibility of having an imperial role. And clearly Suez was where, in fact, the Americans ended up saying to the British, you get out of this adventure, otherwise we're just going to undercut the pound. And it was the last time that Britain could ever politically act outside the American Egypt. And of course, we've seen this continuing over the last 40, 50 years. And a person who was a great friend of mine was somebody who in fact served in Cyprus. Cyprus, of course, was still one of the battlegrounds at the end of the 50s, early 60s, where in fact the British state was attempting to ensure that you end up having uh, some sort of hold on parts of the Mediterranean. I grew up in Manchester, where, as in most places, the Communist Party had a relatively significant presence, both in unions and also in social movements. Unbeknownst to me, there was an independent radical left emerging through the new left. I mean, I didn't know anything of this. There was, however, a coffee bar in Manchester called the Left Wing, which was the sort of place that I would go to uh, dressed in as black a gear as I could, uh, which was probably something like, you know, pale green or something. And I would sit around wanting to be thought of as a beatnik, never speaking to anybody, never having any discussions, but just knowing that this was what I wanted to be identified with, the left wing. Um, revolutionary parents, if there were any, were very small, very localised and with limited influence. And I knew nothing of them at all. Yet I grew up in a very political household. My father was a trade unionist, a socialist, public sector worker, an autodidact. He'd left school when he was 12. And he just was one of the people 
who read completely avidly. But he was also, in my book, a wonderful man because he was completely arrogant. He loathed most people he met. He was a very good advert in that sense for socialism because it wasn't like sort of, you know, holding people around and drawing them on. He would just argue with them and then walk away. But the thing that was interesting about him was that he didn't know in the 30s whether he was actually in the Labour Party doing entry work in the Communist Party or vice versa. <laughs> and it was, but he was very interesting. He said, and it was always a wonderful thing, he would, when anybody ever came to the house, he'd always say to them, why is it that I, in 1935 in Germany, was able to hear a Communist Party speaker speaking in public? And everybody would be sort of completely confounded as to why this could be. And it turned out he was on uh, a boat going to Russia. And in the Kiel Canal, it was Wallhangton was actually making a speech to everybody on the boat. So this was, you know, the communists in the middle of Germany, Nazi Germany, but of course it was just on a boat. However, my mother was a socialist, very strong-minded, very puritanical, and a scientist. And we grew up, four of us grew up in this household, which was very, very clearly political, but also very isolated in many ways from things that were going on around you. But it was a cusp of the 60s. Uh, music was hugely important, rock and roll, jazz, and the beginning of youth culture. For me in particular, theater was hugely, hugely important. And I wanted to be an actress, so I was going to the theater as much as I could, or acting as much as I could. But there were very significant playwrights at that time. John Osborne, Arnold Wesker, David Mercer, John Arden. All four of them were absolutely central in terms of what they were putting on the stage, very often with huge difficulty. Because, of course, you still had the Lord Chamberlain, who would be looking through any script and agreeing whether it goes ahead or not, or demanding cuts. And then, of course, the film. And for me, it was, you know, all the British films that were coming out, Sporting Life, Billy Lyre, etc., etc. But also, at the beginning of the 60s, when I got to university, I was suddenly aware that there was French cinema, there was Italian cinema, there was Japanese cinema. And these, again, were hugely, hugely important influences, cultural influences, for a very particular layer, I think. And then just to explain, I mean, clearly reading was very, very important, but my dad, and it is an exception, uh, my father said to me, just when I'd finished university, so it was the sort of mid-60s, he said to me, there are two books that every young woman should read. The first is Mary McCarthy's The Group, and the second is Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook. Now, it was quite surprising for any man at that time, to say to his daughter, these are the books you should be reading. Because if anybody doesn't know about it, The Golden Notebook was, in a sense, the, the whole sort of opening up of a young woman to politics. And her also her recognition of her own sexuality. And the group was this very similar sort of book. It was about women becoming conscious and becoming aware and needing to act. And that was something that was there as background for me. So I was growing up in a culture manifesting the end of deference, with struggles that were attempting to liberate us in many areas of life, wanting to create what might be called now transformative power. <coughs> we would never have used those terms. I went to university and I was a member of something called NALSO, which I can hardly remember anything about the National Association of Labour Student Organisation. And the reason I knew nothing about it was it was dominated by very loudmouthed men. So the, we, we were the sort of cannon fodder who were dragged out on, you know, you come along and you do a picket or whatever. But people who were going to be doing meetings or going to be speaking or anything were the men. But there were, however, really important things, just in terms of political changes at that time, the whole thing on national liberation struggles. I can remember, for example, many meetings that we were having at the time in solidarity with the Angolans and the Mozambicans attempting to throw off the, the controls of the Portuguese, but it could have been anywhere. CND, of course, was hugely important because we'd grown up in the 50s. 
And the 50s, everybody was convinced <coughs> that at some point, our end would be the four-minute warning. And it is astonishing that now that is something that has no resonance anywhere. And yet, of course, we could all still be waiting here for the four-minute warning. We won't know what the warning is, of course, when it arrives this time, but you would have known in the 50s. And, and it was, of course, the issue that for large numbers of youngsters was absolutely central. It was going to be getting rid of nuclear weapons. The civil rights movement in the States was hugely important. And I, by the uh, mid-50s, well, it was, it was 60, not 50s, 1965, I joined CAST, and I'll explain about that in a moment, but there were about a group of about eight of us, nine of us. And when the news came that Watts had exploded, and for anybody who doesn't know, it was part of uh, Los Angeles, where a motorist, a black motorist, had been stopped. He'd been handled by the cops in front of a lot of people, and immediately there was a, a massive response, uh, with a, a riot that lasted four or five days. And shockingly, 34 people were killed, over 4,000 arrested, and $4 million of damage in that price at that time. And it was eventually, but it wasn't at the time, but eventually it was agreed that actually the whole thing had exploded because of what all of us knew. Huge grievances about high black unemployment, poor housing, inadequate schools. And this was what we saw. But the crucible for our politics, and I think this was true of many, was in fact Vietnam. And it was, in fact, joining Vietnam Solidarity Campaign. And probably significantly, hugely significantly, it wasn't a peace movement. It was a victory for the Viet Cong. It was a victory for the NLF. It was a victory for the Vietnamese people. We were not wanting peace. And that was clearly one of the huge breaks with the Communist Party, which throughout the world was actually talking about peace and attempting to, to maintain that. But Ernie, is, I know, is going to be talking about, and others will talk about VSC later. Cast, for me, was the formation of uh, my politics, I suppose, prior to the IMG. If I want to think of a democratic centralist organization in the best sense of the words, and I know there's been a debate about this, you know, for lots of reasons in the last sort of year and a half, but in, interestingly, about six of us had formed a theatre group called the Cartoon Archetypical Slogan Theatre. And it was triggered by Roland Muldoon being expelled from Unity Theatre, which was a theatre just around King's Cross, which was run by the Communist Party. And Roland was expelled for being a Freudian Trotskyist. <laughs> <laughs> now, all of us, of course, all of us uh, were really amazed that we were being expelled. But, I mean, we got expelled and for being Freudian Trotskyist. We knew nothing about Freud and nothing about Trotsky. <laughs> so what did we do? We immediately instituted an educational program. And if I tell you that what, what had happened was that uh, Roland had signed on as a tutor at the Working Men's College in Crowndale Road, just in uh, Camden Town. He was going to teach drama. We all signed on as his students. And we got, therefore, rehearsal space free for, you know, sort of three or four evenings a week. Anybody else who came to join this acting class ended up being very rigorously sort of, you know, scrutinized and either were pushed out of the door or, in fact, were sort of, you know, accommodated. But there were about seven or eight of us. And it was, it was one of the most amazing sort of processes, I suppose. There was a lot of discussion. All of us were very political and wanting to sort of, you know, be allied to something like VSC. And what we did was we improvised we rehearsed, we improvised again, we cut, we edited. It was a bit like making a film. And we made short plays. And the first one was a 25 minute long play called John D. Muggins is Dead. For what reason did he die? John D. Muggins had been sent to Vietnam by the American army and he died. And we had this sort of agitprop uh, performance where you know two of us were two women and I think there were 
for men in it. And it was the sort of thing we could play in universities, in pubs, in clubs, not on the streets, but actually in some sort of enclosed space. And we performed it all over the place. And we then produced something called Mr. Oligarchy's Circus, which was about an hour long. We ended up extending it when Stratford East agreed that we should run it for a week. But it was, all of us were working part-time and working most of the time with cast. And it was, it was an amazing sort of group of people. Because the one thing you were doing was you were all the time arguing politically. Not only internally, but externally as well. And... I mean, it's just, it is just interesting reflection when you look at, you know, Ben Said's sort of uh, uh, memories of the 1960s and are so conscious, I'm so conscious of the lack of theory that I had, but also, in a sense, the lack of any revolutionary tradition in this country. France really did have, you know, the revolution, the commune, and then, of course, and it's one of those things that you're very, very clear about, that here... Social democracy, in many ways, had just strangled us. I was then also a teacher part-time, and I was uh, a militant in the NUT, which meant, again, contesting the Communist Party. Um, when a comrade and I decided we would actually put a resolution uh, in East London to... Uh, to um, uh, I've given me two minutes. Yeah, 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 okay. uh, to to say that in fact there was racism in school and also in the union that there were uh, NUT members who we thought were racist. It was ruled out of order on the grounds that this was unprofessional. You couldn't attack other teachers. So it was you know it was one of those battles that started in the mid 60s. And I'm delighted to tell you that in fact I'm not having quite the same battles now. That I'm still active in the union now as a retired member. But we were developing practices and visions that questioned the foundation of post-war order. And it was questioning also authority all the time and the neutrality of experts, questioning the bond between authority and knowledge. And in particular, wanting self-organization and as a principle, really, to know that, in fact, all of us could collectively do things. Now, I, there are two things I just want to add. The first is, I think one of the big things that for me was important, and it wasn't just because there were, my, parent, my mother was a scientist and uh, one of my brothers was, but the other thing was, I think for many of us, the question of what was happening in Vietnam, the question of what science role was in terms of weaponry, things like, for example, uh, Silent Spring, and the whole opening up of what was happening with Minamata and other places where pollution was an issue, it was very clear that science was an issue. And towards the end of the 60s, radical science movements started. Both there were some in the States and there were certainly some here. None at all now. Hardly anything. And it's something that I'm quite interested in, in working or doing some work on. But the very last thing, and I will say this, it's about joining the IMG. In uh, cast fractured, in a sense, in 68. I joined the IMG, some joined IS, yes, IS it was still in, in 68, and, and somebody joined the SLL. And so all of us were Trotskyists, but all different sort of, you know, schisms. And the thing that was really interesting was that I always thought, and I still think, I would join the right grouping. And for the following reasons. One, I didn't really understand state capitalism, but I'm sure that's going to be, you know, a long debate. Uh, but the second was about actually the democracy inside an organisation. And I thought that for me, the IMG was an amazing education. It was probably the, the distilled form of an education that university and everything else had just ignored. It was internationalist, very, very clearly internationalist with debates about strategy and tactics that were internationally sort of taken up. But it was also the fact that it was one where, in fact, not only education and organization were very central issues, but the way that, in fact, debates could take place. And I think that, for me, the fact was that you had the right of tendencies, so you could have differences, and you could ensure that those differences were ones that were openly debated. But the other thing, of course, the IMG 
was a place where, in fact, you had two international tendencies, in a sense, localised. And whatever you could do, you had to recognise that there were political differences. It wasn't something you could just brush under the carpet. It wasn't something that was somehow going to be, you know, resolved by a small group of people up there. It probably was going to be resolved by that small group of people, but you always hoped it wasn't. But it was, it was the issue about knowing that the European comrades and some of the Latin Americans had one particular position, and North America had another. And you were very, very clear about that. Now, it may, in the end, have been the reason why the IMG sort of fractured in the way it did at the time it did. But it was also very clear that for people who were in it, what you were doing was you were having to consider different political views of the, the issues that you were wanting to sort of work through. And that, for me, was the proof that this was, without question, an exemplary form of education for us. And I, I could say to you that, you know, you look at the living proof, here is a woman who's not been in an organisation uh, like the IMG since I probably left formally, probably about sort of 75. But what it is, is somebody who has always felt very close to those sort of positions, who's felt very non-sectarian, and who's been active all that time and wanting to remain active. And I think it is something that, without question, it was hugely important.